Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be with you today to launch the report of the Premier's economic recovery team. I had hoped to be there with you in person, but as so many of our plans have had to change as a result of COVID-19, so too it was with this one, and, and it's not possible for me to be there. Our panel has been at work now for eight months, and at the outset, uh, I would really like to express my gratitude to this brilliant and committed panel who have given so much effort, experience, and insight to this work. The mandate was broad. We have studied and discussed all economic sectors, the social fabric in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, and the governance approach in government, in its agencies and corporations, in the educational establishment, the health establishment, and in non-governmental activities as well. We have found from all of our discussions that people are concerned. They want a better set of opportunities for their children and grandchildren. And there is an emerging consensus that we will not be able to take advantage of the assets and benefits of our province unless we come to grips now with the grave financial situation we face. Our report proposes big resets in these areas. First, we have to drive economic growth by becoming a leader in what is the global challenge of our generation, the transition to a green economy. Second, we have to refocus our social compact to concentrate more on the quality of the preparation we are giving our young people. They need higher caliber and different skills to power the green economy. More is required of them than was required of my generation. Their numbers are declining, but the numbers of retiring people in Newfoundland and Labrador is growing faster than any other province. Much more is expected of them for another reason, the huge debt burden we have built up in the past 12 years, which will sit very heavily on their shoulders unless we reduce it. There is a third big reset, and that is in how we manage. This has to be better everywhere. We need to make better decisions. We need to plan better. We need to be more accountable for how we use the money of those who are paying the bills. Governance everywhere, whether at the cabinet table or in the boardrooms, whether amongst leaders and managers of agencies, crown corporations, NGOs, unions, everywhere, we have to work to clear performance objectives and to a financial plan. Of course, there's a critical backdrop to these policy and strategic proposals, and that is the dire financial situation we are in. So we have proposed a gradual but deliberate set of measures, which taken over five to six years will get us back on a stable footing. We can right the ship, but we have to face facts. We are in a time of unprecedented financial challenge of our own making, and it will get worse. The hole will get deeper if we do not begin year after year over the next five to six years to work toward a balanced budget. Our financial predicament has nothing to do with the pandemic, and it predates Muskrat Falls. But the cost overruns and mismanagement of that project contributed to the problem. Our predicament is the result of years of overspending. Every year, our province spends about 25% more than it takes in from all the taxes, fees, royalties, and federal contributions we receive. 
In a 15 year period, we have increased our expenditures by 80%. We kept spending regardless of changes, particularly changes downward in our revenues, mostly from oil and gas royalty changes. To cover the shortfall every year, we had to add to our debt. Now, if you add it all up, the net debt we owe to bondholders, the debt of crown-owned entities like Nalcor and NLC, the other promises we have made but are unfunded for things like pensions for public service workers, our teachers, our healthcare professionals, our others in uniformed services. As of October 2021, the total liabilities have ballooned to $47.3 billion. We have a declining workforce, a declining and an aging population. The amount, this amount, will have to be borne by everyone working, and it's going to go up. We only have 290,000 working people. So that 47 billion in debt and liability sits on their burdened shoulders. This cannot continue. Imagine if you spent every year 25% more than you make. Every year, you then borrowed to make up the difference. Eventually, the level of debt, even in a low rate environment, you could not maintain it. People would start putting pressure on you to repay more than you have available. Eventually, you'd be boxed in, borrowing from Peter to pay Paul the very minimum. Some people think that won't happen, that we can continue on as we have done, that the banks will continue to lend to us, that the federal government will bail us out. That is not a plan. That is a wishful, wistful thought. We in no way subscribe to that view. In fact, the evidence that this is a wrong view is already pretty clear. Former Premier Dwight Ball could not complete his borrowing program. We had no money. If not for the onset of the pandemic, which prompted the federal government to put general help through a Bank of Canada facility, we would have been over the cliff. But we can fix this, and here's how. It starts with better management. This one has several parts. Governments have hundreds of programs. They fund billions in service, and they spend hundreds of millions more on grants to more than 2,000 different non-governmental groups. We need to start evaluating this spending in a dispassionate way and assess whether the outcomes that we are achieving are good enough. We need better reporting. That will give us more accountability for real results. Newfoundland and Labrador is behind here. Better management also means we should look beyond the public sector to do things. The public sector does not have to do everything. Times have changed, needs have changed, and the ways of doing things should also change. There are better, more flexible, more customized approaches available. And these often come at lower cost. We are suggesting balanced budget legislation. This will help to instill a culture in the form of more rigorous management everywhere. It starts with government, but it extends way beyond that. We need to align compensation of management to the achievement of meaningful and quantifiable results. We also need to make more of our assets because we have exactly the right assets. The Churchill River is among the top five river systems in the world, and it is still underdeveloped. The power of the upper Churchill River reverts back to the province in 2041. It can potentially produce more than five times 
green, clean energy, more than five times that we can use on our own. Our oil and gas is some of the lowest carbon intensity oil and gas in the world. It is urgent now that we get our offshore back into production. Clean oil will be a significant part of global energy requirements for the next 30 or 40 years. Our mining assets include the rare earth minerals that are needed for battery manufacturing, solar panels, and wind turbine blades. Our iron ore is some of the lowest carbon footprint iron ore in the world. Industrial scale hydrogen projects are a growing component in the quest to produce green energy. We shouldn't be scared to reconfigure our asset portfolios, especially if the value we achieve allows us to pay down our debt. And as a result, reduce the second largest expenditure we have, which is servicing that debt. Capital is being diverted everywhere for green economy transition, but we will need to compete for it. So the third thing we can do is to create a future fund. Using a portion of our oil and gas revenues, using revenues from asset sales, this will help us attract green capital to the province. We propose the future fund be used for two purposes and two purposes only, to drive the green economy and to pay down debt. By creating partnerships with Aboriginal communities, with the federal government, with the private sector, we can become a leader in green economy transition. The future fund will be necessary to facilitate this. It can also be used to incentivize the technology development and adoption that is a critical part of this endeavor. It can be used to get projects off the drawing board, projects like industrial scale hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. It can be used to create centers of excellence and expertise in engineering, climate science, and technology diffusion. Times have changed, and the rate of change is accelerating. In many areas, the province has not adapted to current realities. At the peak of the baby boom, Newfoundland and Labrador had six children to support every senior citizen. Now each child must power enough economic growth to look after one and a half senior citizens. This is called the dependency ratio, a smaller workforce that is required to look after a growing older population. It is important that seniors in our province are supported and have as much independence as possible. Many people express to us their concern that we are not providing for our aging citizens in the way they would prefer, and there are better ways. It is not acceptable that old age be medicalized. The province's model for healthcare delivery was created 20, 30 years ago, a different time. New technologies have been developed, they can be deployed to offer improved levels of service and often at lower cost. This is urgent. The province is spending 24% more per capita on health care than the average in the rest of Canada. We have, however, some of the poorest outcomes in the country. The province can also do much better in preparing our youngsters to take on the challenges of a green economy, the dependency ratio, and the crushing debt level that has been accumulated. Our education system needs to be better. With only 63,700 children and a very low teacher-pupil ratio, we should have the best K-12 system in the world. The past 10 years have proven that more money is not the answer. 
all of these opportunities will escape us if we don't first get our fiscal house in order. This is why we have proposed a detailed multi-year financial improvement plan. It is a balanced and measured approach, a combination of expenditure reductions and revenue increases and better use of our assets, such that over the next five years, we can get out of this perilous situation. This is not the time for ideological half-truths or a counting slate of hand. The only way out of this is old-fashioned, practical economics. It's not about balancing the budget for the sake of it. It's about paying our bills so we can invest in our future, attract the investment that will make the province a place where our young people want to stay. The plan proposes measures that will get us in the black by 2526. While 2021 is primarily an organizational and planning year, some changes have to start immediately. I am happy to take questions on the detailed measures we have proposed. But before I close, may I ask you this question? In your heart of hearts, what do you think will be the prospects for our province if we fail to make these big resets? What is the future that we can promise to our children? Without action, it's our fear that they will find it is better to move away and to raise their families in other parts of the country as generations have done before them. This report, this proposed big reset, is aimed at them. I hope we can now begin conversations everywhere and come together as we always have and put the province on a stronger footing and once again punch above our weight. Thank you. Thank you, Dame Green. For your awareness, there are 17 reporters registered for today's announcement. R reporters will have the opportunity to ask one question and one follow-up. Our first question comes from Richard Duggan of VOCM. Please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Moya Green. Uh, one of the things in the report is a 25% reduction in funds to the health authorities. Uh, you've mentioned there in your remarks about how our health care outcomes are some of the worst in the country. So how can we justify a reduction in funds to the health authorities? Because money is not the answer. <laughs> if money was the answer, we'd have the best outcomes. Uh, we have to do different things, and we have to be... Uh, more effective in what we do. I think um, we don't need four health care authorities in a province with 520,000 people. Um, we can probably do a lot more with the technologies that are available. One advantage of this very difficult pandemic time has we have probably accelerated our use of um, you know, virtual meeting platforms by five, six, seven years. We can do a lot more with telemedicine. Uh, we can probably customize services better as a result. We do not need our physicians to do everything. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, we have uh, very high quality nursing professionals in the province, we can see many tasks that are now done in general practice offices being done uh, in communities uh, by nursing practitioners. Um, I, I think that um, given the period of time we're talking about, um, if you know, we didn't have as many authorities, we probably don't need four procurements, four finance, four human resources uh, departments, all of those central, central functions being duplicated. Um, but, you know, I think it's up to the uh, health authorities themselves to figure out how best to manage within a, a financial envelope. What, I, what we have thought is very difficult 
is to see how indifferent people are to ordinary managerial practices. And, um, you know, I think uh, given time and, and turning their attention to it and the amounts of money that we spend, this should be doable. And as my follow-up, uh, you mentioned that this is a planning year, yet some recommendations uh, have to be implemented immediately. Which ones would you uh, want to see implemented immediately? Well, I think that uh, in the planning year, we should uh, get ready with um, all of the legislation enablement that will be important for parts of this. So, for example, um, if we are going to put in place balanced budget legislation, uh, if we are going to uh, make arrangements for a uh, future fund, also this year, I think we should really set to work and uh, start putting together that long-term strategy for green economy transition. Uh, there are many pieces to that strategy. Um, you know, we need to uh, look at the targets for greenhouse gas emissions and be very deliberate, deliberate about how they can be uh, met. Uh, we need to start thinking about which projects do we want to lift off the drawing board over a period of time and how are we going to proactively access the capital and the skills and the expertise that we need to be able to do that. So saying that it's a planning year doesn't mean that you do nothing. It means uh, that you take uh, the next you know, four or five months to really uh, start thinking about, well, what does an accountability framework look like if we're going to uh, give accountability frameworks to people like the health authorities or the university or the College of the North Atlantic, uh, then I think we need to set to work and think about, well, what's going to go in that accountability framework? What is it that we are asking the managerial teams to do? What sort of reporting do they have to do? What data do they have to collect in order to do that reporting? How can we roll out things like aligning compensation practices for senior executives and for managerial cadre, and uh, when is it that they uh, will be asked to give a, a public accounting for what they have managed to do. So a planning year, uh, you know, there are many things that would have to be done in that planning year uh, in order to be able to push the green go button uh, as soon as we get to January. Thank you, Dame Green. Our next question comes from Brian Callahan with VOCM. Thank you. Um, I just have a question regarding the future fund. You mentioned the sale of assets as well as uh, oil and gas revenues that could, uh, that should or could go into that fund in order to build it up. Um, given the uncertainty in the oil and gas industry right now, there are a lot of questions about some big projects, including the Terranova SPSO. A lot of uncertainty as to where any of that will. Is it realistic to think that oil and gas revenues could fund this fund, without repeating the word fund, uh, sufficiently in the short term? No, I think you, you're, you're quite right. You build up the fund over time. I think oil and gas uh, revenues are going to be volatile, as they always have been. You know, in a 10-year period, we've gone from $10 a barrel oil to $137 a barrel oil and back down to now around $50 a barrel. So the idea is that um, we want volatile revenue streams not in their entirety to be used to fund current expenditures. We want to put aside a portion of those volatile revenue streams to, uh, you know, look after more longer term needs. But, you know, the fund could also have, um, you know, part of the carbon taxes in it. And as we mentioned, it's really important that uh, we set to work to start uh, reprofiling the asset base that we have just because we owned something 30 years ago or 35 years ago doesn't mean that we need to own it today. We don't need to own uh, the Newfoundland uh, Liquor Commission. We don't need to own Nalcor. We don't need to own, uh, you know, all of the uh, hydro assets. Uh, so, but in order to get to work and to figure out uh, what we should or should not own, 
or how much value we can recoup from these assets and how that value should be redeployed. You know, we have to get expertise. We're going to have to get investment bankers in place and do those valuations for us. But this is a, a good time. You know, equity valuations today are very high. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it seems reasonable to me that if we have competent boards in place and competent CEOs in place and they uh, have actual experience in those kinds of uh, very big reorganizations, we should be able to uh, put significant resources from the reprofiling of assets such as that into the future fund. And that fund will then uh, be used for those two purposes to power the green economy transition, including the attraction of sources of green economy capital from outside the province, but also really, really importantly to begin to pay down the crushing debt load. Thank you. And a short follow-up. I, I notice um, reductions to operating grants are, are mentioned, whether it's uh, MUN, College of North Atlantic, or other organizations. But specifically with regard to regional health authorities, you've, there's a recommendation to reduce their operating grants. Um, I'm wondering how your work has intertwined with Health Court and L's work, and whether or not uh, the current Health Court, Health Court and L is aware of that recommendation, or were, to, were consulted before you put that recommendation and how that jives with the work that they're doing to reduce uh, and to improve outcomes? Uh, we did consult uh, with uh, Sister Elizabeth Davis and with um, Dr. Parfrey. And uh, we did uh, mention to uh, both of them that we were putting in place a financial improvement plan and that um, it would likely include expenditure reductions to, um, you know, in, in many of the important uh, expenditure envelopes, health being the most important one. So they are aware that that uh, was our thinking. And our next question comes from Terry Roberts from CBC. Uh, thank you. Uh, you have recommended some, uh, you're calling them modest tax increases. Can you walk through for us what, how the tax increases you're proposing and how much revenue you believe those tax increases might uh, attract? Yes. In general terms, uh, we're proposing a 1% increase in personal income tax, but we are proposing that all of the thresholds and credits that are in place for low-income uh, residents of the province uh, be kept in place. Uh, so we do not want uh, the uh, least able uh, to be asked to shoulder more of the burden. Um, we are proposing a, an increase in corporate income taxes as well. If you look at corporate income taxes now in the province, you know, they're at their lowest rate that they've been in, you know, 12 or 15 years. We think all over the world, uh, you know, after having a 10-year period when, you know, most developed economies were competing, to reduce corporate income taxes, we are going to find that uh, that situation will reverse. And so we don't think that Newfoundland and Labrador will be uh, offside in, in terms of uh, trend uh, with respect to corporate income tax. Also, it's be, to be noted that 81% um, of our corporate income tax now comes from uh, the larger uh, corporations. And of course, you only pay it uh, if you're profitable. So we think uh, that this is the right time, and given the financial situation of the province, that uh, we can increase corporate income tax. We're also suggesting a, uh, an increase in um, the uh, sales tax. Uh, this is the tax that probably does, uh, you know, uh, contributes a, a, a quite a considerable amount, uh, especially in the early years of the financial improvement plan. But again, you know, in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, we have a lot of exemptions from sales tax, obviously food, drugs, uh, tuition. Uh, we have probably more exemptions as we look to cross sales taxes, you know, in the OECD countries, uh, we have uh, a, a lot of um, uh, what is normally part of a, a sales tax is, is not here in the province, but we think there is room uh, to increase the sales tax by uh, by 1%. We think that uh, we also should be uh, looking at uh, fees uh, in the province, and we're proposing that uh, they go up by 15%. Uh, 
We have fees for all kinds of registry purposes from motor vehicles to property transactions. But we think that we can, uh, there are some creative ways and new ways to raise revenue, particularly with respect to properties. Uh, we think second properties should have a, a property tax. And we think that uh, transactions in relation to real estate uh, should have a progressive tax that is, uh, you know, based on the, uh, the, the value of the, of the transaction. So we're thinking uh, property transactions in excess of 300,000 should have a progressively uh, greater tax on them. And then in an ongoing way, second uh, properties should attract uh, a tax. Um, we also, you know, think that there are problems with uh, property registration in the province. Uh, there are uh, many cases where uh, we were told that uh, there were residences that are being built just outside municipal boundaries, and these escape uh, all taxation, even though services may be provided. So we think uh, that there are opportunities to to move uh, these properties into the uh, tax taxable envelope. Um, we're also uh, thinking about other kinds of wealth taxes. These are going to be discussed as I, uh, I, I think on a, on a, a, a much uh, larger uh, basis over the, the coming years. Uh, the parliamentary budget officer federally has already looked at uh, wealth taxes. Uh, you know, he has looked at uh, uh, taxes that, uh, so, so we think that there are ways for us to, uh, to also do the same, but before we can get a coordinated approach with the, the federal government on this, uh, you know, we would see ourselves uh, moving. Uh, right now, we have a probate fee, for example, but uh, we use it now just to pay uh, the administrative costs of administering estates on the, on the death of an individual. But we think there's an opportunity to uh, collect taxes, particularly for larger estates, so estates in excess of a million dollars, we think is quite reasonable to expect that those states uh, would contribute uh, more to the to the province's financial improvement. That is the case now. Um, so th those are some of the ideas that we have put forward. All right, you make it clear in your report. You reminded us really that we have the largest uh, public service per capita, uh, probably in the in the country, and that uh, many people working in the public service make more. Uh, according to your statement earlier, than uh, uh, similar jobs in the private sector. So you're calling for the, the big reset. You're calling your your uh, report, but you also, I guess, seeking a reset with the unions. What does that look like? Well, I think you know managers and uh, executives in the authorities that um, that uh, employ our our public servants uh, really should think about that. Uh, but, you know, there's no doubt that um, the public sector union leadership in our province is, you know, they probably know as well as uh, I do about the financial situation of the province. And given that public sector salaries are and benefits are 41 percent of expenditures, um, it does seem to me that there is an opportunity for um, a, a good and productive uh, discussion to be had. We've thought about things like uh, salary freezes. We've thought about things like uh, four-day weeks. Um, we've thought about uh, things that don't need to be done in the public sector. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, that's not for us to negotiate. Uh, that is for the leadership in the entities that employ our public service and with whom uh, the contracts are made. But we think that there should be a little bit of pressure felt by public sector union leadership to be reasonable and come to the table and to, to uh, put their shoulders to the wheel with everybody else in the province and uh, to contribute. Um, and so, you know, if after a certain period of time there's no movement at all, uh, we think it's reasonable to consider effective legislative uh, means. Thank you, Dame Green. So I know we only have a limited amount of time, so we're going to keep things moving along with our next question that comes from Glenn Whiffen from The Telegram. Hello. 
limited. Uh, Here you. Oh, there you go. Okay, yeah. Hello. Uh, sorry, didn't think you could hear me there. Uh, many of the recommendations in the report are going to take a lot of debate and work before being fully implemented, if they can be at all. Is the five or six years to, as you say, write the fiscal ship realistically achievable? Yes, I think so. As a matter of fact, you know, if, if we can reprofile our assets, let's say in the next two or three years, uh, and it, uh, realize value to significantly pay down debt, you can then significantly reduce a 1.5 billion expenditure, the second largest expenditure, which is debt charges and financing charges. So yes, we think it, it should be, and we don't have that in our plan, and we don't have the growth that we think is achievable if we uh, really turn uh, our minds to becoming a uh, leader in uh, how to do green economy transitions. And with a small economy, but a re resource-based economy, an economy that has this beautiful asset base, uh, not just the Churchill River, but you know the mining resources that we have, uh, we think um, none of that, we don't have any of that growth factored into our plan. So we think five to six years is more than reasonable. Uh, how important is it to uh get the Gull Island or the uh, Churchill Falls, all the different projects in line for the future of the province, including the return of the 2041 Upper Churchill? We think very important. The Churchill River is a beautiful asset. It's in the top five river systems in North America, the top 20 around the world. It is green, green clean, hydroelectric. It is... Uh, you know, the, the potential is uh, five times greater than we need for our own use. Uh, so we think the Churchill River is a beautiful asset. And even if 2041 seems like a long way off, it'll come in no time. You know, we need to plan now what, how we see the Churchill River figuring in our green economy transition. We can see bundling uh, opportunities uh, for pilot projects, for example, industrial scale hydrogen, or bundling our uh, opportunities in rare earth minerals close to the Churchill River that would be uh, you know, all part of a, of a transition to a green economy. So we think it's very important. Next question comes from Burb Sweet from The Telegram. Can you hear me okay? Um, so so I, uh, I wanna bring you back to the um, the portion about the modest tax increases. Oh, sorry. I'd like to bring you back to the portion about the modest tax increases. And uh, you describe them as modest, but to, and, and there are provisions there for the low income people, but um, for the middle class, uh, and especially those who, you know, maybe single or, or not have a, a large household income, they already are struggling, I guess, to try to live in the province. Um, what would you say to them when, when, uh, when you're asking them to take a higher income tax hit, maybe uh, you know pay more uh, HST, that sort of thing? What would you say to them when they're already struggling? Well, we have uh, very, very seriously looked at that. And uh, what we would say is that the province's financial situation is grave. And um, we've tried to look at all of the sources of revenue and all of the better uses that our assets could be put to uh, to come to grips with that financial situation. And uh, secondly, you know, um, we do want to protect the lower income people as much as possible. And we know that, you know, the middle income people, uh, you know, bear uh, already a, a sizable share. 
But it's important to note that 40% of the taxes in the province are paid by 7% of the taxpayers. And um, we have tried to put in place an even more progressive system of taxation. That is the reason why we think the creative taxes that we're suggesting here, the new taxes that are on wealth or proxies for wealth, like second homes in the province or elsewhere, or uh, you know probates of estates that are larger than a million, or you know gifts um, that are greater than ten thousand uh, dollars at a at a time. You know we what we've tried to do is to say, well, look, it, we've got to sadly ask uh, the wealthy to contribute more, and uh, and it can't just be on the incomes of the middle class. And that is the reason why we have come up with these more creative approaches to uh, make sure that the taxation system going forward is even more progressive than it is today. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, sorry, I don't know why that's not working so well. Can you hear me now? Um, my yes, follow-up would, would be, you talk a lot about, um, obviously, the misspending, the 25% we're overspending per year. And can you, can you elaborate more on how, where, do you, where you think this all went wrong? I mean, during the boom times, what could have, what, what could have been done? What in, what in your mind could have been done different to, to avoid this situation? Well, I think that we should have had across the board a deeper understanding that you just you, you cannot be indifferent to deficits. And you know, we we have been shocked as a panel, uh, you know, to talk to very senior managers in different places who you know just think that deficits don't matter. Um, that's that makes things impossible for for anybody. So there are ordinary principles of management that we think have not been respected for a long time. So one of the resets is on that side to reinstill a culture. Um, what we could have done, you know, other countries in the world have volatile revenue streams too, but they don't because they're volatile. They don't spend all of the money from that source in current uh, expenditures. They put a, a portion of it away for times when the revenue stream comes off. Why? Because the expenditure side of the ledger is usually harder to adjust, takes more time to adjust. You can't adjust it, but it usually takes more time. And so what could have been done? Well, when that year that we had two billion uh, coming in uh, to the provincial coffers from oil and gas royalties when you know the price was up in the 130s or so a barrel, we could have said, well, we're not going to spend all that this year. We're going to take a billion of that and we're going to put it in a fund for when the oil price goes down. And we still have a, a pretty rigid expenditure profile that we have to try to manage. So generally speaking, I think the answer to your question is ordinary principles of management. Uh, put it out there. Uh, what are going to be your performance promises? Measure them. Make sure it's quantifiable. Uh, don't it, it put a financial plan together that uh, he says that you're going to operate within this envelope. Uh, make sure you, you evaluate uh, what you're getting for your spending. We were pretty surprised that we don't evaluate any of our programs. We just keep adding to it. And that, those are just you know, ordinary principles of management. If, if something's not working, you're only going to know that if you uh, look at it and you have um, built in at the very beginning, you have uh, ways to measure what is it that you expected to achieve and how fast. And if you're not achieving it, you should stop and put the money to better use. 
So in, uh, the, the nutshell answer to that question is more rigorous management. Thank you, Dame Green. We're going to move along now to Peter Cowan with CBC. You've said the goal in all of this is to make the province a more attractive place for people to live. But how will increasing taxes, making almost everything more expensive, while at the same time getting fewer services, not encourage people to move elsewhere? I don't think you're necessarily going to get fewer services. I actually think if we weren't so rigid, rigidly adhering to the way in which we deliver services that we know are not generating outcomes that we want, if we changed faster, if we adapted faster, if we applied technologies that we already know about, you'd probably get better services and at lower cost. So that's the first thing. And, and the second thing, um, it's for a time. It's to get ourselves back on track. It's not forever. You know, when we get ourselves uh, in a more stable footing, uh, well, now we have more options. But right now, we're in a very perilous place. You've said, you, you mentioned earlier that, you know, in, in some ways, governments have already known a, a lot of these things. What we've seen is that governments have continually kicked the can down the road, mostly because these sorts of measures are rather unpopular. What's preventing government from taking this report and doing the exact same thing it's done before? I don't know. You have to ask the people in government. Um, the one thing I would say is that it's worse than it was in 2016. We've racked up a lot more debt. Uh, it's it's worse than it was. And it's not a problem that matures well. The longer it takes to tackle it, the worse it gets. It's, it's you know, one of our panel had had a very you know, neat way to describe. If you're in a hole, you should at least stop digging. Thank you, Dame Green. Our next question comes from Alex Bill of All Newfoundland and Labrador. Oh, hi. You said that uh, some of this is, is not forever, but privatizing certain assets would be. And have you um, done any analysis of the big cash generators like Hebron or the NLC to see what kind of price we might get for them and how that compares to the revenues we'd be giving up? No, not those particular assets. We did some very preliminary work on other assets. Uh, I think uh, your your point is very well taken. You, you need to get people that are expert in those asset classes, investment banking professionals that are expert in those asset classes to do proper valuations. And for things like, you know, our oil and gas uh, minority equity interests, you know, you'd want to make sure that you're not selling them at a low point in the market. Um, you'd want to make sure that uh, you're, you're disposing of them at the right time. Um, and my other question is, what, what is the value of having a wealth fund, uh, as you describe it, or a future fund, compared to using these volatile revenues to simply pay down as much debt as possible? It comes to the same thing. Uh, what we're trying to say is that if you have a volatile revenue stream, you shouldn't spend all of it in a current expenditure year. You should make it a matter of managerial practice that a share of it, only a safe share of it, can be spent in that year. And anything over and above that safe share should be put into the future fund. And the future fund should have limited purposes. It should not be available to fund ordinary operations of government or ordinary expenditures. It should be there to you know, manage the big problem, which is the debt load, and the strategic opportunity, which is the uh, greening of our economy. Our next question comes from Michael Connors of NTV. Uh, your report mentions the province is approaching the debt wall. There are several months worth of consultations on your report to come after this. I, I guess, what do you believe the consequence would be if your recommendations get watered down through those consultations? You know, that's hard to predict. Uh, I don't know. I did not talk personally to the bond rating agencies, but you know, at one point in my life, I was in capital markets and I did a lot of work with bond rating agencies. And in those days, 
you know, people like uh, the professionals in bond rating agencies, they would, they would be patient, but they'd want to see that our government and the people of Newfoundland and Labrador were prepared to do sensible things to get the financial situation on a more stable footing. Um, so I, my honest answer is that I, I don't know. I, again, with, the fed, with respect to the federal government, you know, the federal government has just taken us through, and we're not quite there yet, a very, very uh, massive uh, set of economic problems attributable to the pandemic. Thankfully, you know, uh, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador was was uh, able to manage that situation uh, much better than than other provinces. So I don't know what the federal government is going to do over the medium term uh, to get the economy of the country back on track post pandemic. Uh, but you know, in the old days, when I was a senior federal public servant. Uh, the federal government is uh, has always been uh, an outs outstanding partner, and it is uh, certainly the the strength of our confederation is attributable to the way in which uh, the federal government has has managed its its uh, responsibilities and authorities. But I, in the old days, the federal government would only be able to do so much for the province because, uh, in fairness, there's one taxpayer, and whatever is given to the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Other provinces who may be approaching difficult situations themselves will watch carefully. And you know, while the Newfoundland economy is a, a small economy, it's a smaller province, and so the amounts that we're talking about relative to, say, the province of Ontario are much smaller. But you know, the, if, if similar situations were to arise in a, a big economy with 14 and a half million people like Ontario, the federal government would be wary of moves that it would take. Also, you know, the federal government, even though it is a, an incredible uh, partner in our confederation, the federal government would not want a province to feel that, uh, you know, they could um, ignore ordinary managerial principles in uh, managing their economy. Um, you know, that's, that, at the end of the day, is definitely not good for the Confederation. So my honest answer is that I don't know. But in the old days, uh, and, and, you know, circumstances may be different right now uh, as we try to recover from the pandemic, but that's going to come to an end. And it's, you know, we're probably going to see, uh, you know, our, our way clear uh, when we get uh, closer to 2022. Um, then I, I think uh, people like bond rating agencies and indeed the federal government, they will look to see what the people of Newfoundland and Labrador and the government of uh, Newfoundland and Labrador are going to do to, to fix their own problem. You also recommend eliminating NALCOR, and I'm just wondering how will that work in the context of the Muskrat Falls contracts, the federal loan guarantee? There's a lot of very restrictive language in those contracts that make NALCOR a partner in that project. So how will eliminating NALCOR work? It's a big reorganization. There's no question about it. But, you know, there's a lot of duplication of assets, and um, we think that with respect to NALCOR, it's far too complex and unwieldy uh, you know, for the size of our province. And, uh, you know, we have suggested in our report, um, you know, the sorts of things that might be done to various parts of the organization. It starts with, uh, I think, getting a very experienced board in place and a very experienced CEO in place, one that is uh, got a, a background in managing a major reorganizations like that. Our next question comes from Kellyanne Roberts with NTV. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, the mic was not working. Um, when it comes to looking at establishing a minimum tax to be applied to residents outside of incorporated municipalities, also looking for government to reevaluate what services and how they deliver them, looking to more privatize or not-for-profit, 
what were the talks regarding regionalization and, and looking to incorporate some of these incorporated municipalities into incorporated municipalities? We had a little bit of discussion on that, and I had the great advantage of uh, meeting with um, you know municipal authorities, uh, the municipal association, in fact, two or, or three times. And there's no question that with the number of municipalities and the very small size of many of them and the difficulties, especially in the tiny ones of having expertise to do, you know, just basic things, you know, to apply for funds to, to uh, you know, improve um, sidewalks and things like that. Uh, we're, our organization of um, the municipal uh, system and the municipal administrative structures uh, is probably not optimal. But uh, in honesty, we didn't spend a long time on that. When it comes to the tax increase, uh, we're looking over the six-year period here. Uh, HSD in particular, looking like we'd be the highest tax province then. This six-year period, and then what? We just remove that, or, or what would be the indication to go forward from there? You know, that will be up to government at the time. And I expect what would happen is that they would look every single year uh, and see how much progress they were making. And they would look at, you know, the economy and how how fast it was growing. Uh, they would look at how much progress was being made to improve services, to apply technologies more. They'd look to see, you know, whether these accountability frameworks everywhere where was uh, uh, encouraging the kind of more rigorous management that we think needs to be a big cultural reset everywhere in the province. So I think, it, 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 you know, I don't want to speak for the government on this, but, you know, if I put myself for a moment in their difficult shoes, I, I would say that they would look at it every year and they would take stock. Thank you, Dame Green. Our next question comes from Drew Brown of The Independent. Hey, um, actually, I hadn't thought through too many questions before right now, but uh, the first thing that popped into my head is, uh, given the uh, cultural anxieties around a lot of the language around quote unquote great reset and similar things um, in the general popular culture right now, um, was it really wise to call this report the big reset? I don't know. I don't know what you mean. What are you talking about? <laughs> Fair enough. I'm probably spending too much time being brain poisoned on the internet. Um, but there is a great deal of uh, hand wringing and conspiracy theorizing that the COVID pandemic um, has given governments leeway to bring in lots of scary big transformational changes, um, colloquially known as the Great Reset um, in the Davos economic circles and such. Um, and I'm just wondering how this is going to play, given that the government that's going to be looking at implementing these recommendations just received an extremely dubious mandate from a very dubious election. I don't know how to answer that. You know, call it what you want. What we're saying is that a number of things have to change, and they're important things. We have to embed a different culture in order to put the province on a more stable footing and take advantage of the wonderful assets that we have. Our next question comes from Antonia Whalen of The Independent. And that comes from Patrick Butler of Radio Canada. Bonjour, Madame Green. Uh, vous, vous recommandez l'abolition uh, du conseil scolaire francophone provincial. Um, il y a des droits linguistiques en jeu. Um, Avez-vous considéré la constitutionnalité uh, de d'éliminer un conseil scolaire francophone provincial? Non. On n'a pas fait euh, des recherches en la matière de la loi, euh, de n'importe quelle partie de la loi, surtout euh, les matières constitutionnelles. Ce que nous voudrions euh, recommander, euh, c'était que euh, l'administration, pour euh, les euh, 
les établissements scolaires soient plus minces. Maintenant, euh, on a vu qu'il y a beaucoup de dépenses qui, à, à notre avis, euh, ont l'air d'être pour, pour des choses administratives. Et nous voudrions simplifier l'administration euh, pour euh, tous les établissements scolaires. Ce n'était pas une question constitutionnelle pour nous. C'était une question financière et euh, concernant la, la manière de gérer les établissements euh, scolaires. Avez-vous eu des consultations avec le conseil scolaire avant de, de, de recommander euh, qu'il soit aboli? Non. Merci. Nous avons, euh, nous avons fait des recherches avec tous les rapports qui étaient faits euh, nous avons consulté plusieurs experts euh, dans le domaine euh, d'éducation, euh, mais pas les, euh, les, euh, les gens de l'administration scolaire. Thank you. Our next question comes from uh, José Basque from Radio Canada. Euh, bonjour, Madame Green. Euh, première question, donc, euh, vous, vous insistez sur euh, une transition verte, une économie verte, euh, notamment en proposant d'investir dans les, les forages en mer. En quoi cette proposition est-elle en accord avec les, les principes de protection de l'environnement qu'on connaît, qui, qui ont des lourds impacts euh, environnementaux euh, avec ces projets? Oui, c'est vrai. Vous avez raison, Madame, qu'il y a des questions environnementaux en ce qui concerne n'importe quelle sorte de projet. Mais pour nous, c'était une question de faire une stratégie à long terme et de, 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 de trouver des moyens de, de développer la rivière Churchill en entière parce que c'est un des plus importants en Amérique du Nord. Et euh, même euh, avec euh, les, euh, les questions qui sont réelles, environnementaux, euh, nous imaginons qu'avec une consultation et partenariat avec euh, les euh, communautés euh, 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 aboriginales et avec euh, un partenariat avec le gouvernement fédéral, euh, en cause du fait que c'est un euh, défi euh, très important, euh, la création de l'économie verte euh, partout au Canada et aussi pour euh, Terre-Neuve, ça devrait être possible. Mais il faut d'abord avoir une stratégie et en consultation avec euh, euh, des partenaires. Vous parlez de, de stratégie, euh, puis vous avez parlé aussi de hausse de taxes, diminution de services. Pour les personnes qui nous écoutent, pourriez-vous, euh, pourquoi elles devraient justement rester dans la province alors qu'on annonce de tels, euh, de tels redressements? Euh, des, euh, concernant les hausses de taxes, c'est ça? Oui, et, et l'impôt puis la, la diminution des services euh, par rapport à ça. Donc... Ben, nous trouvons que la situation financière euh, dans la province est un, vraiment un défi et c'est urgent que ça soit amélioré. Et euh, nous avons proposé alors euh, les haussements de taxes, mais aussi euh, les réductions importantes des dépenses. Ça, ça nous fera, euh, ça nous faudra les deux, les deux choses, les deux éléments pour améliorer la, la situation financière de, de la province. Thank you. And our final question comes from Sarah Smelly with the Canadian Press. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, how do you yes, expect... Thank you. How do you expect people will react to these recommendations? Hmm. That's a good question. I think it will depend on, uh, you know, the part of our province that you're talking about. I think if you are a young person in school today, 
staring at that debt load, staring at the um, challenge of our generation, which is to manage better uh, the uh, climate change, staring at uh, the dependency ratio, uh, you will want to see the province put on a more stable footing. You will want to see the opportunities opened up to you that can come from um, pursuing a strategy to green uh, the economy, pursuing a strategy to green um, our uh, and apply our green and clean sources of energy across uh, the whole industrial base. So I expect if you're a young person and you're looking at this, uh, you may think that uh, these are necessary measures to take for now. If you're a person that's being asked to pay more tax, you probably won't like it, but if you believe, as we do, that this is necessary in order to put uh, the province on a more stable footing and to take advantage of the asset base that we have, you'll probably grit your teeth and say, yes, okay, as long as we start cutting our expenditure cloth to fit uh, where we are. And if you're a person who's, uh, uh, you know, who are affected by any of the expenditure cuts, uh, then, you know, you're probably not going to want to see any of it happen. Um, but, you know, if you take a longer term view and you ask yourself what else is practical, given that we have now 12 years of spending 25% more than we take in, and as a result, we've accumulated a very uh, worrisome uh, debt level, even you, you might uh, be big enough to say, yeah, I, I see that, that this has to change. You probably will, most people will probably like a more rigorous uh, managerial approach to everything, that we start uh, collecting data, reporting on how we're doing, evaluating programs that we make uh, boards, uh, you know, a more responsible, that the oversight function of boards uh, come into view more clearly than it has done, that, uh, you know, we're reporting on uh, how corporations or non-governmental entities are doing, that we do see that compensation is being aligned to actual results. You'll, you know, you'll probably like a lot of that. So I think it depends. And I also wanted to ask, um, you spoke of this, this kind of ambivalence toward or complacency with deficit in, in the managerial levels of the provincial government. Where do you think this came from? I'm not sure, but you know, if every year your government doesn't seem to be bothered by uh, a deficit, then the people that work for that government would probably come to believe that it's not important. On the other hand, if everybody that works for that government every year acts as if deficits are not important, then that's going to contribute to the overall deficit. So I don't know, uh, in honestly answering that question, I don't know where it came from, but we certainly have a long history of it. And that concludes today's announcement. Thank you, Dame Moya Green, and thank you to the reporters in the room and everyone tuning in. If you would like to learn more about The Big Reset, please visit thebigresetnl.ca. Dutch regular programming already in progress. The 
following program is brought to you by Rogers Anyplace TV. Enjoy exclusive content for free. Visit RogersAnyplaceTV.com. Hello, I'm Lloyd at Quito. I'm here at the rooms where we just finished recording a Show in Our Culture series. This is a place where you get to